so what uh, what we want to encourage uh, encourage you to do is to drop your comments and questions in the chat. We will respond to those, and then at the end of this, uh, if you stay all the way to the end, there will be a link to another website where you'll have an opportunity to um, where, where you'll have an opportunity to. Uh, 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 to see some more resources. Uh, there's a bibliography there. There are links to the videos that you'll see during this presentation. And, um, and, and then there's also a place where you can uh, generate comments and offer feedback. So I, I hope that you'll take advantage of that website afterwards. And it is www.goseelove.org. But that'll appear at the very end of the webinar as well. So with, uh, without uh, further, to, further to do, I'm going to ask you to think about and, and put these in the chat room. Uh, what are the things that you see happening in your own community right now and in your own community of faith that, that tend to be uh, inward oriented, that, that, that consume the time and attention of, of, laters, of leaders and laity and clergy in the church uh, that prevent or inhibit the church from uh, from being as outwardly outwardly oriented and as as uh, deeply connected in its community as possible. What are the th the blockages that you're seeing happening in your church? And just drop those into the into the chat room. I see Lisa is uh, sharing with us uh, some disputes about about worship style at her church that uh, that uh, consume the attention of the people. Uh, uh, Michael is in a is in a campus. Of Crossroads Church in in Kannapolis, and and he's talking about ha being able to ret retain people within the satellite campus. Uh, Matt says there's a lot of institutional maintenance that he has to deal with, and uh, 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 Tom is is sharing with us uh, building maintenance and expansion that can be extremely uh, time consuming. Worries about budget concerns. Yeah, how to survive with an aging building and fewer uh, able members and leaders. Okay, so well, those are those are some some uh, some interesting uh, blockages that you're that you're talking about. Staffing unable to make a decision with asking without asking senior leadership. Uh, conflict over vision whether to relocate. So I can see that uh, that what we're seeing here is is a is a a, a lot of. Of, uh, of things that we recognize are blockages. And I'm going to turn over to Jeff now. And uh, Jeff's going to just share with us some insights about, about the impact that, uh, uh, that we can have in, uh, in addressing a variety of, 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 uh, of the blockages that we face. So you're going to uh, stop seeing me for a while, and we're going to uh, uh, turn it over to uh, Jeff. Jeff, carry away. Well, good morning. Um, one of the things that we're going to do uh, I just is lost. to just remember that um, it makes a difference what we do as individuals, and to really now you're, and to really drive that point home. Um, you're, you're, we're going to look at a, in and out with a us, video Jeff. clip about a, a young man named Johnny, Johnny the Bagger, and um, I think this video clip really helps us. Remember that it is all about. I'm not. You're not, um, huh? Well. <laughs> well, uh, Steve, are we still there? Oh, I'm still on, yes. Okay, well, then if, um, if everybody can hear me, I'm going to continue on. 
Let's look at the video clip on Johnny the Bagger. I was asked five years ago to speak to 3,000 employees of a large grocery store chain, and they brought everybody. After I'd spoken, I always give my home phone number to every audience. I had a young man who called me, and he told me his name was Johnny, that he was a bagger in one of the stores, and he was a person of Down syndrome. He said, Barbara, I liked what you said. And he said he went home that night and he asked his dad to help him with the computer. And he said, the, said we set the computer up into three columns. And he said from that night on, every night that he goes home, he finds a thought for the day. And he said, if I can't find what I like, I think one up. Then he and his dad type it six times on a page. He prints out 50 pages every single night, cuts them out, signs his name on the back, and the next day, for every person's groceries he bags, he puts a thought for the day in the bag. Now, about a month later, the store manager called me. He said, Barbara, I want to tell you what happened this morning. He said, when I went out on the floor about 9.30 this morning, the line at Johnny's checkout was three times longer than any other line. <laughs> He said, I went ballistic. I was yelling, get more people out there, get more lanes open. And he said, the customer said, no, no, we want to be in Johnny's Lane. We want the thought for the day. So who do you think is the most important person in that whole store? He said, one woman came up and said, I only used to shop once a week, but now I come in every time I go by because I want the thought for the day. <laughs> He said, three months later, the store manager called me back again, and he said, Barbara, you and Johnny have transformed our store. He said, now in the floral department, when they have a broken off flower or an unused corsage, we used to just throw them away. He said, now they go out on the floor, and they find an elderly woman or a little girl, and they pin it on them. He said, one of our meat packers loves Snoopy, so we ordered 50,000 Snoopy stickers, and every time he packages a piece of meat, his meat gets a Snoopy sticker on it. Now, I said, I don't know about dog stickers on me. <laughs> but he said, we are having so much fun, and our customers are having so much fun. And folks, that's a true leader. And if he can do it, there is no reason why every one of us in this room and out there in our audiences can't do it. Thank you. God bless. Okay, well, there's Johnny the Bagger, and here is a young man who, um, simply because he cared to uh, make a difference, he did make a difference. I think one of the problems that we have in a lot of our churches is that we assume that we have to do big programmatic things. And when we do big programmatic things, it makes us feel like individually we're not um, all that important and we can't make a difference. So. What I'd like to do is talk about four different ways in which uh, we are to be like Christ. Um, this comes from the work of Alan Hirsch. Uh, I strongly recommend anything Alan uh, Hirsch writes. He's a fascinating writer. And he says that Christ uh, relates to people always um, with a sense of proximity, presence, powerlessness, and proclamation. And uh, let's talk through uh, those those three things, those four things, um, just a bit. Um, the first thing is proximity. Uh, the Word of God became flesh and blood and moved into our neighborhood, and so we are supposed to be very much um, embedded in the community in which we are, um, where the church exists. Uh, we're to be part of the larger community, not separate from it. And so instead of trying to build um, a parallel Christian universe to the rest of the world, we want to stay connected to the rest of the world, because that's what Jesus did. He didn't go and then act like he didn't want to be with anybody. Uh, we are in the world, with the world, on their turf, without trying to keep our distance. We're one of them, and we seek to know them, to hang out with them, to do life with them, to share life with them. We're relationally engaged with them as friends and family and colleagues. And as much as possible, within the bounds of our uh, Christian integrity, we share their culture, their language, their dress, their values, their pastimes. And um, 
their interests. We move into the community and we are with them. We're proximate. So that's the first thing. And a lot of churches kind of act almost as if they're a castle in the community with a drawbridge brought up and a moat around and, you know, a sanctuary away from the world. But that was never Jesus' style. The second thing is that um, we want to be present with people that we're close to. In other words, we're meaningfully related and engaged in the lives of those that were being served. And the reality is that Jesus hung out with just about everybody. I like to say that, that Jesus didn't have any taste in people. He would hang out with anyone. And um, the list of people that he hung out with is really pretty long and pretty varied. In fact, I don't know of anyone in his world that it did not include. And um, the practicing the presence of Christ in the midst of the world means that we relate to people. We don't seek to avoid people that are different or treat them like they're just, um, uh, you know, background for our life um, or people that just serve us. We seek to act and speak and serve with compassion and mercy and to speak truth uh, as, as, as disciples of Jesus Christ, but relate personally to people. And um, I love this quote by Henry Nouwen. He says, it is a privilege to practice this simple ministry of presence. Still, it is not as simple as it seems. I wonder if the first things should be to know people by name to eat and drink with them, to listen to their stories, to tell your own, and to let them know that you do not simply like them, but truly love them. And you might think about some of the things that we do to be in ministry to people. A lot of times it's pretty impersonal. We hand out a water bottle, and that's fine if people are hungry, but do we know the people? Do we get to know their name? I think we're not really in ministry to people until we know their name and they know ours and we know something of their story. Well, the next thing um, that I'll mention is powerlessness, taking the form of a humble servant, not powering up but empowering others. And I think one of the things that uh, we American Christians have a, a problem with is a kind of us, them, sort of dualistic way of thinking. We're good, they're bad. We're full, they're empty. We're wise, they're foolish. We're rich and they're poor. We're smart and they're, well, they're kind of slow. We're really important and they're not so important. We know it all and they don't know very much, but we're going to tell them. You see, if we, we need to relate as those who humbly recognize that we too are sinners who are tempted and struggle and stumble and stand in need of grace. We're not that different. We need to relate as those who have questions and doubts and are tempted and struggle. We need to recognize that the others that we deal with, uh, even if they don't recognize it, are still children of God, gifted by God in ways that we are not, and are just as uh, worthy of honor and respect as we are. And therefore, how we relate to them is not like um, one up, but as more on an even keel. Uh, we, we seek to learn from them, to listen to them, to be blessed by them as well as bless them, to share power with them, to collaborate with them, to partner with them as much as possible as equals. And so we let ministry be one of mutuality and, um, and a kind of two-way flow. Uh, rather than just one way, for, for blessings to be offered and received, and community to really be genuine, but, um, like between brothers and sisters, not moms and kids, and dads and kids. I think of all of these, uh, the powerlessness may be one that I work on the most. How do I enter into... Um, how do I enter into relationships with people that don't presume or with a sense of arrogance that I'm the powerful one, the full one, the whole one, and everybody else is um, less than that? Okay, and then the final thing is proclamation. 
And uh, that really just uh, means that, you know, when we enter into people's presence, relate to them in this uh, Christ-like way, there will come a time when, when they're going to want to know, why do you do that? What's different about you? And we need to be able to share um, what that means uh, with them. Uh, we need to be able to share, for example, what God is up to in the world and how we're part of what God is doing in the world and how they can be part of what God is doing in the world with us. So if we think about our ministry um, at a local church level in terms of these four P's, um, proximity, presence, powerlessness, and proclamation, then they really provide kind of lenses to help us uh, be more Christ-like in what we do. Well, and now um, Steve is going to uh, talk about uh, a very helpful um, a model that's called the, the College of Ministry, I believe. Graduate School of Ministry, there we go. You are on.
Hello. Um, I think you all have shared some really beautiful things in the chat down there about some of the things that, that you've been about, uh, the community gardens, the Cub Scouts, the, the day laborers, all of those are ways to begin to connect with folks in your community, get to know people in your community. Uh, we've had some pastors and some churches do some other really creative things. You see a couple of uh, the photographs on the screen there. Just imagine what you might learn about your community if you spent a night riding around with police officers, seeing really what happens at night where you live and places maybe you haven't ever been or seen or maybe even just listening to the heart of that police officer that's driving you around and the, the burden that they carry for your community. Or um, imagine what might happen if you just observed in a courtroom for a day, the things that happen in there, the stories that are told, the, the pain, um, the difficulty that goes on in people's lives in scripture. Um, Somehow Jesus was able to see into people's lives in a pretty powerful way and taking opportunities to go to some of these places might give you an opportunity to sort of see the world and your community with those eyes that Jesus had and have that passion for the crowd, for the people around you that Christ might have. There are, um, just imagine who you might interview, who you could talk to in your community that might have some information for you that would be helpful. Um, who, who knows everything that's going on in your community? I was with a pastor in a, in a neighborhood recently where some fellow who'd just been released from jail for dealing drugs uh, came up and talked with him, and he really, he knew everybody in town and their story, and uh, it was a really beautiful relationship because that fellow knew everybody. But who is it that, that you might know? Would it be a, an elementary school principal? Teachers often know an awful lot about the lives of the children that come through their doors every day and sit in their classrooms. Um, who is it that, that you would know? Or maybe someone at the local gas station. They get to hear a lot at those... Uh, counters, maybe almost as much as a bartender in some places, or maybe there's a bartender somewhere that could tell you a lot about the needs, the hurts, the people that are challenged in the places where you go. Uh, and maybe you could just take a prayer walk around your neighborhood. It's surprising how open people are to being prayed for and with. And if you just walked around your setting for ministry with a prayerful eye open to your community, you'd never know what the Spirit might open up in your eyes or in a relationship or in a life of someone who is around you. For a pastor who's trying to develop a relationship with a community, um, it's another opportunity to talk to strangers. I realize we all were taught not to. And so maybe in some ways we need to learn to uh, break some habits that we were taught when we were children for safety. But now that we're a little bit older and have the opportunity to um, choose safe conversations, uh, we can do something that's a little bit different now that we're older. Um, there's a neat video that talks about how to meet strangers, how you can just engage in a conversation and just let the conversation be the point. Um, it's not that you have to preach for conversion in that moment. Uh, it's not even that you have to invite them to your church, but just engage in a conversation to see what someone else might be able to teach you and enjoy the meeting. Um, this video will give us an opportunity just to learn a little bit more about how to meet strangers. All right, Steve. 
I'm not sure how to make it go. What's the trick to making the video go, Steve? So now we're back with my friend Chris and we are going to talk about uh, the purpose of these interactions and that is that meeting people is the end in itself. Uh, so we're not trying to gain anything and I know that you're a salesperson so right. I'm sure that that must sometimes come into play because most of your work involves some kind of exchange or transaction. That's true. So I want you to go out now, and when you approach people, I want you to just think about having the exchange be the point. So you're not trying to get anything from them. You're not thinking about something that could happen down the line from this interaction, but just to have the, the actual moment be the whole point. Does that sound good? Yeah, that sounds great. All right, great. Okay. Ever been to like the bottom, like Kosh? Kosh? Where is that? Uh, Kosh is... Um, Oh, in, in the... Uh, in yeah, the, in it's Turkey. on the Mediterranean? Yes, yes, yes. That's in Antalya. Yes. Yeah, that's right. the south of Turkey. The south, south of Turkey, yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Kind of bleeds into some of those German Rieslings. Right, yeah. right, and those Riesling, are nice right. if you don't want to get too wasted. Perworst and yeah. Perworst terminers. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, would you say some of those are very floral almost? They are floral. Yeah. yeah. Um, case by case basis, but I agree. So meeting people is an end in itself. Um, how did that go? It went well. Um, okay. I feel people are eager to talk to one another. Um, so getting something out of someone else, I, I don't think is a primary motive. Okay. You know, Great, yeah. Conversation. You know, it seemed like you had some lovely interactions. Well, Chris, thank you so much. I really appreciate you being our guinea pig and taking time to put these tips into action. Well, <laughs> sure. Thanks for having me. So what could you do if you took the opportunity getting a little lost on the technology here. If you took the opportunity to just meet people as an end in itself and if you had to gauge the amount of time that you spend say on a weekly basis just meeting people. I wonder how long you would estimate that you do. Um, it didn't take long to generate that list at the beginning of our conversation about all the things that um, keep our attention in the church and everything from um, you know debates about worship to building and maintenance issues and administrative kinds of things. But if you had to figure out what you do with your time, could you say that as much as 20% of it it'll is spent echoing. just meeting people? If you t tell me just having conversation? That, are you getting an echo from me? Hello. I hear you, Jeff. This is Steve. Can you hear me? There's Steve. Yeah. yeah mm -hmm. I had to change computers, so... Uh, Okay. All right. Well, I see there's still people here, so I guess we're still up and going. <laughs> we are. My computer crashed. Okay. I apologize. Uh, uh, it froze and then crashed, so that's why we were having uh, things freeze on us here. Okay. But I'm on another computer now, so I, I won't. Be, you won't be able to see me. But that's probably a blessing for everyone uh, to not be able to see me. I don't think so. So I'm seeing comments that uh, that people people are spending some time out in out in the world meet, meeting people and um, uh, but uh, but aiming towards 20 percent sounds pretty pretty intense what do you think about that folks now, since I stepped away Amy 
Uh, what did you have next? Uh, are you still carrying along? Because I'm, 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 I'm blanking on where we're at. Yeah, I just showed Since the I video about meeting strangers and just opened the conversation about the 20% of time. Oh, great. And um, people are, I think, have some some really good comments about, you know, where are the people? Where would I go? Um, you know, I only spend an hour. Could you double it? Is 20% seems like too much. Could you double it to two hours? Somebody just said that a baby makes it easy to meet people and having been a new mom, I know that's true. Everybody wants to ooh and awe over the baby. Um, we have a, a pastor in a, in a very rural place in West Virginia who's taken his laptop to McDonald's and they have free Wi-Fi, so he just sort of sits up there and he does some of his um, sermon prep and he's got a sticker on his computer that indicates something about Christianity. I can't remember what it says. But he said it's been a really great place to meet people and connect. In West Virginia, we only have about three Starbucks, so that's not that's not always an option for us, but he found McDon McDonald's to be a great gathering place to connect with people and just hear their hearts. Somebody takes walks on Saturday afternoon Are there other I find that uh, that it, that people are open to conversations if you just uh, change the uh, change the tenor of a transaction. So uh, uh, sometimes people do that with me. I was at Panera Bread the other day, and the cashier uh, took my card, and I was really impressed because uh, th uh, she took my card, and instead of just swiping my card on the cash register and and making a charge, she uh, she instead asked me how to pronounce how I pronounced my first name. And so I, I talked to her for, for a few minutes, but what was surprising about that is that it broke us out of the transaction mode. Mm -hmm. So I actually saw this person as a human being. She saw me as a human being. And, uh, and, and now she uh, calls me by name when I come in. Well, she's probably trained to do that at Panera. But the point is, is that people are open to conversations with you if you just will, uh, will kind of change the tenor of the transactions. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Here's somebody that took some, yeah, people. had some courage in going out um, in a place that may have been a little bit scary to meet folks. Shelly? Not your normal hangout spot? That's great, asking people questions about themselves. And I think the, the video sort of said that too. It was um, just sort of questioning about what people liked, where they wanted to go. Um, but I remember him talking about perfume, something smelled more floral, maybe it was coffee. Good. That's great. And so as we, we build this awareness of the people that are around us and begin to learn about them and the things they like, the things they care about, um, how do we move from what we've learned and then our awareness and the call that Christ has for us to offer missional gestures and begin developing relationships? There was some good conversation as Steve was sort of drawing that out for us when he put the diagram. How is it that we provide those sort of um, missional on-ramps where our, our lives can come together in a really important way? Uh, way to learn and to share and even how do we learn how to adjust our time and our work life and the life of our congregation in a way that helps people find an on-ramp into the life of Christ the folks are, are typing again and somebody had typed earlier about I don't know if I can get back up in the comments about a, a ministry to, to day laborers that was turning into an ESL class then. At the, and that was, a, I thought, a really nice way of sort of illustrating making those first connections and then beginning to provide um, sort of a missional on-ramp for people to begin to get connected in the church. And um, sometimes those things don't happen Okay, I was reading Matt's comment about it's off-putting for sometimes for people to 
if you the first thing you say is I'm a pastor um, sometimes that comes with a lot of baggage for people and sometimes our our life and our ministry becomes so automatic and um, a little bit overwhelming and so we need to find ways to create space to plan to do something differently and learn new behavior oh great that's a great question about suggestions for missional on-ramps in affluent neighborhoods yeah uh, you know uh, affluent people have have needs too mm -hmm. um, and and one of the things that I've discovered when I was at, at Myers Park is that the things that I was I was kind of naturally uninclined to do I had to force myself to do uh, you know I'm I, I was never a member of the club I grew up in a blue collar uh, in, a, in a blue collar community in West Texas and 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 so um, uh, I, you know I was I was really intimidated about going to the uh, to the country club with people uh, but what I found was that uh, that just happens to be where they gather. So, uh, and they gather there for a lot of good reasons. So, if I'm going to be in ministry with them, I do I do need to be present in the places that they go. Now, I would not do that exclusively, but uh, but you have to think about uh, the places that they gather. So, that's where you end up uh, going to civic organizations, the Rotary Club, uh, charitable organizations, serving on boards of of nonprofits. It's in those places that you encounter people who are in more affluent uh, sit, uh, situations, and and have opportunity to be engaged with people who are who are uh, affluent and yet still far from God. Mm -hmm. And learn the kinds of things they like, and go to the places where that's done. And I think sometimes it can be surprising to people to find out that a pastor can be sort of normal in conversation. I see the conversation going up there um, about people, whether or not they admit they're a pastor on the first go round. Some of that depends on who you are, what you are, um, but you still need to be honest about who you are too. Um, you certainly don't want to develop a, a relationship that becomes sort of a bait and switch, sort of. either. Absolutely. Somebody mentioned kids ball games. Kid ball games and PTA meetings have been some of the places have been so powerful for me to get form relationships. When you're sitting on the soccer sidelines. There's not A lot else to do. And 
and that's a great question about people can begin having the conversations begin to understand how to behave differently as well. We have the Um, notion and that uh I am back. Uh, can you hear me?
Good. The church's church attendance is automatic.
I don't think Jeff's on anymore, Steve. Are you still there, Steve? Steve? I can do it. Yeah, I can do it.
I'm not doing anything. I, it's moving itself. This is the This is the missional church. Simple. In the past, churches have spent large amounts of resources to construct the most attractive places imaginable for the community in which they were situated. Great music, compelling teaching, and a host of programs designed to gather people together were the staple of such church communities. This is the missional church. Simple. In the past, churches have spent large amounts of resources to construct the most attractive places imaginable for the community in which they were situated. Great music, compelling teaching, and a host of programs designed to gather people together were the staple of such church communities. Anyone who wanted to come was welcome, and church members were encouraged to invite their friends and neighbors. Generally, people had a pleasant experience. The people who came and were cared for seemed relatively similar. Education, income, pastimes, race, struggles, and histories seem to be almost identical. Eventually, someone asked the question, What about all the people who aren't like us, but who live around us? Well, why aren't they here too? In response, the church increased its marketing budget, direct mailing the community, taking out ads in local papers, buying radio time, releasing a fresh web page, and offering to host the world's greatest event. The church was determined to be the center of everything great that happened in the community. Church members began to rely on the church to do the work of conveying God's story in the world. If someone could be brought to an event, they could hear about Jesus from a professional teacher. Inviting people became synonymous with evangelism. The missional church, on the other hand, empowers its members to be the church in the community. The church trains, resources, encourages, and challenges its people to live out the good news in their community with those who would otherwise be suspicious of a church and its marketing efforts. The church sends out its members to live among people unfamiliar with church customs, songs, and what it holds sacred, just like a foreign missionary. The missional church recognizes then that every believer embodies the life of the church in their neighborhood, in their school, or at their place of work, each one of them telling God's story in the context of compassionate and genuine relationships. like a foreign missionary. The missional church recognizes then that every believer embodies the life of the church. place of work, each one of them telling God's story, God's story in the context of compassionate and trying to get This is the missional church. Church. Simple.
back, Steve? I am back. Um, can you hear me? I'm showing. I'm showing that my my audio is coming up, but can you hear me? Yeah, I got you. Okay, you can't hear me. Okay. All right, folks. Uh, <laughs> well, the technology has definitely uh, 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 been uh, been challenging here. I hope this has been useful for you. I think I think we're we're I'm I'm kind of at the point where I'm I'm going to have to stop uh, because I I'm not sure where to go here. Um, I could make. Um, I, I, I don't think that I can I can do anything, and we're reaching the end of our time. So let me let me just close with a with a few words, and I want to encourage you to stay uh, to stay with the presentation until the very end because when I close this, it it um, it uh, yeah that's right. The Verge is a great website, and as a matter of fact, there'll be a link to the to uh, to the missional uh, to some missional ideas on the Verge. Uh, whenever this ends. So let me just share with you uh, uh, just, just share with you uh, just a, a closing thought. What, what, what we're hoping for in this, in this webinar is just to point you in the direction of, 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 of pursuing this to, and, and to encourage those of you that are already involved in this uh, to, 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 not, to not lose heart. Because I, I believe that God is at work in a in a powerful and beautiful way in these in these new um, uh, in these new missional uh, initiatives that folks are taking, and the things that you're describing in your chats, uh, in your chat, are exactly the kinds of things that that are giving me hope that the that the church can be transformed. But it, but the, the, if there's one thing that I take away from this, that this is about relationships rather than programs. This is about the way we connect with people in, 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 in individual relationships and in small groups more than it is about transforming the worship uh, style of a congregation or, or uh, uh, changing the way we structure the administration of a church. So I, 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 I want you to continue to work on these relationships and uh, not lose heart and to connect with one another in, in mutual support and accountability. So the way we, you know, I'm hoping that we, we will uh, develop more structures that will allow us to do that. You know, we're trying this webinar that allows us to be able to connect with each other about these things for a few minutes without a tremendous amount of, of personal overhead of traveling. Uh, as the technology, you know, becomes more, uh, I guess, reliable, uh, that may be more helpful than it is right now. But I just want to express my gratitude to everybody for spending 90 minutes with us. And uh, 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 and if you would like to um, uh, to say anything about this webinar and about how we could improve it, other than the obvious technological things, there's going to be a survey link, the very first link at the on the on the web page that'll come up when this is over. There'll be a survey that'll allow you allow you to give us some feedback. So thank you for hanging in here, and uh, and I'm just so grateful for you. I'm going to draw this meeting to a close. And, uh, and send you to the, to the uh, goseelove.org uh, website, goseelove.org website, where the other materials and links will be available to you. So thanks to everybody. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Jeff, if you're still there listening. And uh, God bless you all. Thank you. Have a great day.